Hi, Year 10, Mr. Tavley here to walk you through your next lesson of uh, Year 10, How to Get Away with Murder. Uh, so obviously, a bit different setup <laughs> during remote learning. This video, I'm just going to outline uh, what we'll be doing in our classes this week during remote learning, uh, how to access resources, where to complete activities, um, and where to go for support. Uh, so in the past uh, year, during remote learning in 2020, all the fun times we had then, I found that students weren't really super, super fond of the live Zoom lessons, having them every single day. Uh, it was a bit much, a bit overwhelming. And on the other side of things, not receiving any support at all and just having to go off what was written in the Compass lesson plan uh, wasn't really enough guidance, not enough um, help for, for students. Uh, so the happy compromise that I've come up with is basically each lesson, I'll be creating a little video lecture, basically outlining uh, what the slides are, uh, what the activities are, working through the content with you, trying to explain some of the more difficult content in uh, more detail, and giving you instructions on what we're doing for uh, activities or assessments. Um, and I found that works relatively well um, in terms of keeping students engaged and giving you guys an opportunity to uh, take responsibility for your own learning. So instead of me yelling at you during a Zoom lesson for 50 minutes, you can pause the video, you can rewind the video. Um, you know, if you don't understand something, you can use this as a resource, you know, later on when we have assessment tasks, you can go back and study the video uh, to revise the content. So hopefully this works. Um, if not, if you're not a fan of it at all, please let me know and I'll try and change it, edit it, or do something different. Um, but I can only really do that if you let me know how you're feeling. If you have any questions, please let me know. And if you have any concerns, of course, let me know. So what I'll do this lesson is go through the lesson plan, which is up on Compass. Again, I'm trying to keep things relatively simple, you know, using the same things that we've been doing in class uh, each lesson. So you've got your lesson plan on Compass, which tells you your learning intentions, success criteria, uh, what we're doing with the slides, and et cetera, et cetera. You can find all the resources, uh, such as the slides, in Compass and also Google Classroom. So that's your class slides. In terms of where you're completing the lesson activities, um, you've got two options. So you can either continue working in your physical notebook. So just recording notes in your physical notebook, uh, textbook questions, lesson activities, etc. I'll be checking your notebooks on Thursday when we go back to school, uh, hopefully. <laughs> um, so don't feel like you have to send me, you know, some two bit photo screenshots of your book. I can't read the handwriting, I guarantee it. <laughs> um, so yeah, just take the notes in your notebook and I'll check the work when we get back to school. The other option is using, I guess, this digital notebook uh, that we've put into Google Classroom, which some students seem to be a fan of. So it's still there if you would like to continue using it. So you've got the little Google Doc file, which if you click on, you can just add in the lesson topic, the date, you can take notes uh, for your own purpose. You can answer questions there. And then I can access this document uh, to monitor, to view what you're up to, you know, give you feedback, help you with difficult questions. Um, a lot of students as well have already created a file similar to that. But if you go into the assignment, this is the teacher version, but the student version should have you an option to um, add a file, to add an attachment where you can add in your own version of the digital notebook, if you will. And I can just keep track of what you're doing each lesson. So in terms of what we're actually doing today, though, according to my lesson plan, we're going to slide 48.54. So I'll go there now. And the focus for today's lesson is Nazi opposition. So basically exploring the depth of opposition to Nazi policies and the ethical concept of innocent bystanders. So we're looking at who opposed Hitler, you know, who resisted the Nazis, did anyone resist the Nazis, and how much success did they have? And should we be judging these people as guilty or innocent based on, you know, oh, you didn't stand up to Hitler, you're a bad person, you know, stuff like that. So we're outlining the, oops, if I can move my face, stay, the local and international opposition to Nazi practices and policies, and reflecting on the actions or lack of action of those who witness the path to genocide, the Holocaust, which is our next topic. If I can get the slides to work, there we go. So some of these slides, activities, and uh, I guess discussion questions, obviously you won't be able to complete uh, 
to the extent that I would have liked to because we're doing remote learning. The option you do have though is maybe you learn better with others. So if you'd like to use some sort of application like Zoom or Discord or whatever you know, messaging app you have available to you, whatever technology you young people use, maybe you can go through the slides and go through the videos together. And you might be able to discuss some of these questions. Instead of just taking notes in your notebook, you might be able to discuss them uh, with a friend, with a classmate. And that might be a better way of staying engaged and enjoying uh, what we're doing each lesson. So a common question we consider when reading about the rise of Hitler and Nazism and the atrocities of the Holocaust is how could this have happened? That's a question I certainly had when I was a student and I was studying this in year 10 history many years ago, is how could an entire country, an entire world of people let this happen? Like, did no one really oppose this? Did no one want this to not happen? <laughs> so a few discussion questions you might consider if you're talking to one of your mates. Again, it's not mandatory. It's not something you have to do, but something to consider if you're sitting here and watching the slides or reading the slides or watching the videos with a friend. What level of resistance to Nazism do you believe existed in Germany? Do you believe there was any international opposition to the Nazi party policies? So you can consider what we saw in the documentary we watched the other week about uh, the policy of appeasement, where Hitler just kept doing dodgy, dodgy things, and we kept letting him get away with it. None of the foreign countries invaded. Uh, what power did Hitler and the Nazi party hold that allowed them to control German life? Just something to reflect on when considering, oh, these people didn't do enough to stop Hitler. Maybe they couldn't. <laughs> Maybe Hitler had all of the power. He had literally everything that he could have used to stop people from resisting. And do you believe the people who did not actively oppose Nazism are innocent bystanders? Do you think they should have done something or was it fair that they weren't able to do anything? Something to consider. Now, those who, I'll have to move my face again. That's gonna be annoying. <laughs> those who denounced the Nazi regime faced intimidation and threats from the Gestapo, the SS, imprisonment, or even in some cases, execution in this environment of terror that discouraged opposition. So Hitler set up an entire culture, a national culture, where speaking up and stepping out of line was very much a dangerous thing to do. <laughs> it could very much impact your health and happiness. How he was able to do that is something we've already talked about briefly in our previous lesson, which was the Enabling Act of 1933, which banned political opposition, which meant that other political parties couldn't really speak up because there was only one party, it was the Nazi party. <laughs> um, censorship and propaganda got rid of any media opposition. So no one's gonna be talking trash about him in the media and radio and newspaper because he owns the media. And Hitler, eliminated any economic opposition. So businesses and workers couldn't express their displeasure because he got rid of those business groups, trade unions, workers unions. So there were many people who genuinely believed the Nazis were improving Germany. That's another thing to consider in terms of why didn't people stop this? There were people who actually thought the Nazis were the good guys. You know, they ignored some of the bad things that were happen as I guess necessary evil. So, okay, Hitler's a bit, you know, crazy, he's a bit over enthusiastic but he's still doing a good job. You know, it's a ne necessary evil to restore Germany back to its supremacy, national supremacy. So I've got a quick video down there for you guys to view. It's only three or four minutes, I think, which talks about basically the enabling act and this slide uh, in a bit more detail. And it shows you, if I can get the video working, well, if I can find my face as well. Um, it shows you some footage of the Nuremberg trials, which is gonna be a topic we look at later on in the unit. Um, yeah, but it's cool. It shows you like active footage of them talking about how Hitler set up the Reichstag fire as a uh, false flag operation, basically. So he deliberately set fire to his own building to get people concerned and you know terrorized, basically terrorize the public. But anyway, quick little video there just to, I guess, uh, reinforce what we're talking about in the slides. To find a good place to put my face. Anyway, so in terms of German resistance, so Nazi uh, opposition at home, the Nazis were supported by the majorities of the Germans. Failures of the Weimar Republic had basically said, you know, the previous form of government democracy, it's crap. And unemployment levels of the Great Depression, Hitler addressed those by creating these massive infrastructure projects like the Autobahn and by enlisting people into the army. So I need people with jobs, you can be a soldier. 
Hitler had also pursued an aggressive foreign policy, expanding German territory by annexing the Rhineland, Czechoslovakia, and Austria in 1938. This expansionism and reconstruction of the German military attracted nationalist support. So you had the soldiers, ex-soldiers who supported him. You had people who believed you know, Germany is the number one country in the world, the nationalists. Hitler was doing a good job in pleasing them. So there was a lot of support. However, there was some resistance uh, to Hitler. There was some resistance to the Nazis. These individuals were isolated and they weren't unable to enact, I guess, major change because Hitler had the major tools of power under his control. However, there were movements such as the White Rose uh, movement, which indicate the crimes of the Nazis were not all approved by all Germans. So there might've been people who opposed them, but they just felt powerless to do so. But the White Rose were a group of students, university students, but you can still relate to them as students, <laughs> um, who acted to resist the Nazis. They set up a movement, they were spreading their own anti-Nazi propaganda. So that's another quick little four or five minute video which I highly recommend you have a look at. Anyway, uh, moving on. In terms of foreign opposition to Nazi Germany, we had that policy of appeasement, which we talked about in previous lessons. So there were lots of opportunities to stop Hitler. <laughs> in 1935, Hitler violated the Treaty of Versailles by rebuilding the army. We did nothing. In 1936, he moved into Rhineland. We did nothing. <laughs> in 1938, he took part of Austria. You're seeing a pattern, basically. This policy of appeasement of letting him do what he wanted to prevent another war. I guess we were so concerned with starting a war that we let a war develop out of hand. It would have had the opposite effect, this policy of appeasement, and catastrophic consequences, because supporting the rise of Hitler led to the deaths of millions of people in World War II, and it led to a path of genocide in the Holocaust. That's just a little cartoon there, a little primary source that shows it's a bit hard to read, but you've got the spineless leaders of democracy. So the presidents and prime ministers of these countries like France and Britain, America, who just kind of let Hitler walk all over him like a little staircase up to his supreme power as the Fuhrer of Germany. Now, the money slide is, oh no, it's not this one. I just put this one in here because I thought it was a cool little quote um, from Martin Niemöller who was a Lutheran, was a religious uh, a priest, a minister, and he was also part of the Nazi party early on. And then he was imprisoned by the Nazi party later on for opposing Hitler's regime. It's a very famous quote, which gives you, I guess, a really good understanding of this idea of why people did not oppose Hitler initially. So first they came for the socialists, speaking of the Nazi party, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. So I didn't opposed the Nazi party because they weren't targeting my group of people. Then they came for the trade unionists, another group of people that Hitler was aggressive against. And I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. So just escalation. He keeps taking away people, but I'm not doing anything because it's not me he's impacting. However, then they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me because Hitler had already imprisoned everyone else because I had let him do that. So just a nice little quote there, or sad quote, <laughs> however you look at it. Um, I guess giving you into the mindset of someone who was there during the rise of Nazi Hitler in the Nazi party. Now, this is the money side. So three questions we're gonna be completing in our notebook. Again, I've got little instructions here to talk to your classmates, to have a class debate. <laughs> Not going to be possible, um, so we're just going to be completing these questions in our notebook. But if you'd like to complete them with a friend, with a classmate, feel free to do so. You know, get on some sort of messaging application. You young people should be able to navigate that pretty easily. Um, but I'm happy for you to do them individually or working collaboratively, completing these three questions in your notebook. There's no textbook reading. You're just really using what you've learned in the slides, uh, what you've seen in the videos, and your own thoughts, your own opinions to answer these questions probably two or three sentences for each response. It doesn't need to be an essay. It's just a couple of sentences to respond to the question. So question one, do you believe the people who did not actively oppose Nazism are innocent? Are they innocent bystanders? Or do you believe they are guilty of the crimes of you know, letting this stuff happen? Question two, outline the context of this quote. Now, this is a quote from Winston Churchill, who was the former prime minister of uh, Britain. He was the prime minister during World War I, and he was later on the Prime Minister 
during World War II. So he's discussing this uh, policy of appeasement. You were given the choice between war and dishonor. You chose dishonor and you will have war. And that was a quote he gave at the Munich conference, I guess saying that this policy of appeasement is bad. <laughs> you guys had the choice between starting a war by you know getting in there and you know, being mean to Hitler or just letting him walk over you. So dishonor, and they chose dishonor, and it's going to lead to a war eventually. A very prophetic quote, I think you'll find. And finally, question three. Do you believe World War II and the Holocaust were inevitable? You know, were they always going to happen? Or if we had acted differently, could these events have been avoided? It's something dangerous to look at in history, this idea of what if history, because you could say that about anything. Um, but the question is asking, I guess, could we have avoided these things? Do you think they would have happened regardless of you know this, this, or this? Or was it always going to happen because there were so many different causes and events and things that were going to make these things happen eventually? So three questions to write out into your little notebook. If you have any questions or concerns, again, please let me know. I know this remote learning crap can be a bit overwhelming <laughs> at times, a bit stressful. I'm sure we're having flashbacks to what happened last year, but it should only be for a few days. And if you feel like you need uh, extra support and extension, additional uh, advice on some of this stuff, uh, feel free to let me know. You can talk to the house leaders. You can talk to myself. Um, you can talk to well-being. So there's lots of support available. You guys just need to let us know that you need the help. Uh, so best of luck again with this, guys. If, if you have any questions, let me know. But uh, good luck. Looking forward to seeing you on Thursday, hopefully. And uh, cheers.